Welcome to Lorology. Sure, other online lectures might teach you about physics or history, but here we talk about equally important things. Things like space wizards, religious schisms, and really big dudes. I'm your instructor, Loricus the Lore Master, and with me as always are my eager students, Paul and Brady. Say hi, boys. Hi, hi boys. boys. So, I understand you kids have been getting into Warhammer 40k lately. Well, good. Today, We'll be talking about the grim dark future of Warhammer 40,000. You boys excited? Oh, um, that sounds kind of scary. I don't know. That sounds kind of grim dark. Hey, let's do it. Well, there's lots of content to go over with Warhammer 40,000. A living, breathing universe of over the top heavy metal space fantasy madness. Sure, there's a mini war game and various spin offs, but there's also books, video games, cartoons, comics, even a few albums in the 80s. Yes, boys, we have some rich, juicy, positively dripping lore to go over. And to dig into all of it, well, we'd be here all day. So for now, we'll stick to one tiny slice of the universe, namely the perspective of the entire human race as we know it! Perfect. Oh. <laughs> Good start. Oh. Good start. <laughs> uh, just, just look at the timestamp. You'll live. Now, boys! Have you ever had the kind of day where things started out promising but just kept getting worse? Yeah, oh. that's when I met Brady. Well, in the universe of Warhammer 40k, humanity's entire existence has just been exactly that. 13,000 years into our future, humanity reaches the age of technology! We developed complex artificial intelligences, turned lifeless planets like Mars into gardens of green, and to make things even better, we just figured out faster than light travel! By using special devices called warp drives, humanity could slip into a dimension of pure thought and emotion called, well, the warp. Using this technology, humanity was able to extend its reach, creating a vast confederacy of millions of worlds, all of it with Terra, Earth at its center. Yep, thanks to our advanced sciences, humanity had it made in the shade. But for all the predictive AIs, nobody could have guessed what was happening next. You know, I think we we want to stop there, right? Where yeah. everything is good, everything's, everything's happy. good, happy, and great. One day, random people started to produce strange phenomena. Stuff that defied all our scientific notions. Turns out, magic was real. But it wasn't that kind of magic that you'd see done by some wand-wiggling trust fund kid nerd in glasses and a floppy hat. Those who expressed this eldritch energy were called psychers, able to channel the warp through strange, grim dark magic. But these psychic powers were volatile. Anytime you cast a spell, there was like a 60-40 chance of your head just exploding. Oh, jeez, gosh. And it certainly didn't help that most of this magic was just sort of spilling out of people involuntarily. Someone would just be walking down the street, stub their toe, and boom! Worse than that, if one of those untrained mass market Merlins so much as pulled a coin out of the wrong ear or picked the wrong card, they'd accidentally summon demons. That's right, demons were a thing now. See, turns out that all that time popping in and out of the dimension of pure thought and imagination had some consequences. People had marked the warp with their sticky little thingies, and now bad thoughts or impulses were manifesting and growing teeth and claws, and sometimes guns. So you're saying that if there w we just had the right mentality, we, we wouldn't be having this issue, right? In instead of, we could have produced unicorns and rainbows and lucky charms, but instead, Demons. Guns and demons. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was basically just like one wrong move and your entire city block turned into a heavy metal album. I'm going a, I'm to a practice positive thoughts only from yes. now on. And thanks to some reckless meddling, not all of it humanity's fault, mind you, the warp, that calm, if weird place we'd been using to travel from planet to planet, had become, well, actual hell. That's right. If you wanted to go somewhere, you had to literally go through hell to get there. I'm good. <laughs> you know, I think I was just stay at home. <laughs> yeah, this wasn't like, this was like the quarantine, but instead of like worrying about mask mandates, if you so much as stepped outside of your door, you'd get your face smashed in by Turbo Satan with a chainsaw arm. Okay, how do people even survive? <laughs> <laughs> they super didn't. Things were bad and things were about to get worse. So, as if our main means of interstellar transport looking like a Bosch painting, and people just randomly exploding into demons wasn't bad enough, things got worse! To us, it should come as no surprise that a society reliant on AI technology would eventually suffer from the obligatory evil machine revolt, 
But, to our credit, they were too distracted by wizards exploding into demons to notice the master computer programs pulling a Skynet and trying to nuke the humans off the planet. Oh, Jesus. We got everything up. We got one thing on both sides. Yeah, we got demons to fight. <laughs> we also got the AI Terminators. So, two concurrent apocalypses later, and humanity had lost centuries of scientific and societal advancement while being completely cut off from the universe. Thus began the Age of Strife. That's gonna be on the test, the Age of Strife. Yeah, right that's there. right, he, he emphasized that one. I would test you on it, but unfortunately, not much is known about the Age of Strife, other than things sucked and there were demons everywhere. While humanity managed to avoid extinction by way of evil sentient robots, a lot of societies were left at square one. Oh, and Earth was run by a clan of techno-barbarians, which, I don't even know who, I don't care who you are, that sounds rad as hell. But now, it's time for a flashback, ladies and gentlemen. Well, mostly gentlemen. Flashback to 8000 BC! Somewhere in the Anatolian Peninsula near modern-day Turkey, a bunch of shamans got together. They'd seen the terrors that would come from the warp, and decided they needed to create a new man to try and survive it. Hey, you guys ever do that one thing where you go to a soda fountain and fill your cup with every flavor of soda to make, like, a super soda? A graveyard. Yeah. yeah I've, all, I've heard it, all the time. I've heard it called a suicide, but I like a graveyard better. It's getting a lot more tasteful. Either way, <laughs> you're ending end the life. The shamans did that, but instead of a soda, they poured out their own souls, and instead of one of those big convenience stores cups, they sort of just crammed all their soul essence into the nearest baby to be born. Their souls mingled, and with that newborn child, this Wee little baby eventually grew up to be an example of what the ultimate human could be. A ten foot tall, super smart, strong superhuman with crazy psychic powers! That's right, lads. You may not like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. This ultra swole super wizard would go on to simply be known as the Emperor. So that's how Henry Cavill was born. That's how I imagine The Rock, Dwayne The Rock Johnson to have been born. The Rock is the Emperor. Oh, write that down. Write that down. <laughs> now, the Emperor had been content to just witness human history, subtly influencing it from the shadows. But when demons, a robot apocalypse, and a bunch of teched out cyborg LARPers started wreaking havoc, he decided, okay, nuts to this shadow ruler stuff. It's Biggie's time to shine. And shine he did. Using his impressive knowledge of warfare, science, and diplomacy, the Emperor wiped out the marauding techno-barbarians and united the factions of a post-apocalyptic Terra and appointed himself the ruler of Earth. Well, with Terra fully under his control, the Emperor enacted the next phase of his plan. Using his own genes, he cloned himself 20 sons he called the Primarchs. They would go on to radically shift human history, but for now they're just a bunch of sweet little babies. Aw, look at them. Now, we won't go over all of them today, but the two most important ones for now are Horus and Sanguinius. Keep those names in mind, we'll come back to them later. Now, originally the plan was to raise these babies on Terra and use all of them at once to reunite all of humanity under the Emperor's rule. But remember those demons I mentioned earlier? Well, they weren't huge fans of that. So a few snuck in one night, stole all the wee baby Primarchs and scattered them to different worlds. So now, the Emperor had to put on his solid gold battle pants and march off into space himself to try to get back all his kids. And while he did eventually gather all of them, by the time he had, they'd grown into adults with their own lives, aspirations, and plans for the future. This Emperor guy, I guess he's just nothing but a, one of those deadbeat dads. Deadbeat dad! Right? He took so long to find his kids that they're all grown up now. He was, he was busy working on his career that he forgot about his own children. Uh, he, but... But in his defense, he did literally have to fly through super hell to get to them. Hey, that's a sacrifice, that's for sure. Now, the Emperor might have just made the Primarchs, but he wasn't exactly what you'd call a great dad. Just ask Angron, a Primarch who was leading a slave rebellion before the Emperor just sort of took him back home, leaving his fellow rebels to die. Or Martarion, who swore a blood oath of revenge against his archenemy only to have the Big E come and steal the kill out from under him. So yeah, deadbeat dad is kind of a good way to put it. Say what you would about his parenting, but at least the Emperor got each of his kids a gift when he found them. Nothing too extravagant, really. Just uh, 
an army of genetically enhanced super soldiers personalized with bits of the Primarch's DNA, these eight-foot-tall, roided-out space knights would be the Adeptus Astartes, or, as we know them now, the Space Marines. Dang, well, my dad got me for my birthday with some socks. So, each Primarch went to work, conquering worlds and bringing them under the fold under the Emperor's banner, whether they wanted it or not. Thus was born the Imperium of Man! But under all that gold and eagle decor, the Primarchs he'd spurned and neglected started to resent the Emperor, and none more so than Horus. Sure, Horus was the apple of his dad's eye, but he figured it was only because the Emperor saw him as the most useful. Maybe he thought his father saw him less like a son and more like a heavy stick to keep his worlds in line. Hey, remember how I said there was a dimension of pure emotion and that demons lived there? Yeah, turns out that the ones that scattered the Primarchs to begin with had been listening, waiting for that resentment to crystallize. And when it did, they revealed themselves one by one to these disgruntled Primarchs. Enter the Chaos Gods! Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Chaos Gods! Spawn from the worst impulses of sapient minds, we have Nurgle, demon god of apathy, decay, and disease! Korn, god of rage, hatred, and bloodshed! Zinj, god of plots, deceit, and sorcery! And last, but certainly not least, Slanesh! God of excess, obsession, and hedonism! And then we have Brady, God of laziness and white claws. Oh, the worst of the chaos gods! One by one, the four dark gods played on the flaws of the preferred Primarchs, seducing ten of the Emperor's twenty sons to their side, first and foremost among them being Horus. Convinced he could run the Imperium better than his father, and fueled with spooky dark powers, Horus gathered up his like-minded brothers to wage a civil war known as the Horus Heresy, or the Black Crusade. The resulting battle was catastrophic. Brother was pitted against brother, and worlds like Prospero and Nistvan III were destroyed as legions of Astartes warriors clashed, one half loyal to the Emperor, the other half fueled with spooky demon powers and strange mutations. In time, the traitor legions battered at the very doorstep of the Imperium, Terra itself! At the war's terrible climax, Horus appeared in the Emperor's throne room, challenging him to single combat. The Emperor fought bravely, but seemed to be holding back. But this would be his downfall, as Horus dealt a blow from his mace, sending him tumbling to the ground, mortally wounded. Sanguinius tried to defend him from Horus, but was struck down, so gruesome was Sanguinius' death that it convinced the Emperor of what he needed to do. Using the last of his considerable psychic power, the Emperor annihilated his son, body and soul. Their war master dead, the traitor legions fell back, retreating to a vast hole in the warp known as the Eye of Terror, where many wait to this day, preparing for a chance to finish what Horus started. Is there a god of therapy and mental health in there that can help? <laughs> they did that? Need that yeah. for sure. After this catastrophic battle, the Emperor was reduced to a vegetative coma. His golden throne converted to a life support system, his body would wither away over the centuries until he was a skeletal shade of his former self. Despite the Emperor being vocally anti-religious, the people of the Imperium sort of just forgot those teachings and worshipped him as a god. And not a friendly god either, more of a join-or-die kind of god. Witch burnings, heresy trials, the whole shebang. It was worse if you were an alien or a mutant, which the new religion considered to be unholy enough to be killed on sight. So, there you have it. Humanity had a rough go of it, with moments of brief golden ages intercut with periods of incalculable human suffering. Suffering that, ironically, might have been avoided if the Emperor had used any of those super psychic abilities to actually communicate with his kids. And like every other great empire in history, he failed to see a world where he wasn't in charge, and for that, humanity as a species suffered. But it might not be all bad forever. Recently, one of the Emperor's loyalist sons, Rabute Gulliman, has revived from a stasis after being poisoned. The Primarch Gulliman, whose special superpower was literally just being really good at statecraft, 
has since taken the helm of the Imperium and is intending on making it suck marginally less. Will he succeed? Only time will tell. But I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Oh, I want to hear more. Well, there'll be plenty of time to learn more later. But that's it for today's lecture. But if you're going to learn anything from today, let it be this. In the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, there is only daddy issues. Thank you once again, Paul and Brady, for being excellent students. We'll see you next time. For now, class dismissed.